Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the EPUS webinar organized by the Lower Links uh, Study Group on the topic X linked hypophosphatemic crickets. It's a complex congenital disease. Uh, orthopedic problems are quite often and burden the quality of life of these patients. I'm Rudi Gange from the Orthopedic Hospital Vienna Speising, and I'm the moderator of this webinar. Please, the next slide. We set up a program with a goal to present an overview about that disease. Our first speaker is Dr. Albert Ryman. He's an pediatric endocrinologist and uh, osteologist. He's a consultant of the Vienna General Hospital and University of, of Vienna. His topic is pediatric perspectives and treatment options. Second speaker is Joachim Horn. He's an associate professor and is a chief of the pediatric orthopedics at the Oslo University Hospital. He will speak about clinical, radiographic, and functional aspects. Last speaker is Christopher Adler. He's an associate professor. He's a deputy of the head of the pediatric orthopedics of the orthopedic hospital in Vienna Speising. And he will speak about uh, different orthopedic treatment options. I think we'll have an interesting session. Questions can be asked to the faculty using the question function. At the end, we have time for these questions, which can be answered by the faculty. Let us start now, and I'd like to hand the micro to Dr. Ryman. Ali, please, please start with the first talk. Thanks, Rudy, for this nice introduction, and thanks for having me for this APOS webinar. And um, it's my honor to be the pediatrician now, representing a little bit of the pediatric perspective of this very interesting and still not entirely understood disorder of X-linked hypophosphatemia or X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. Um, in, my, in my clinical work, I deal a lot with patients of XLH caring for the largest cohort of XLH patients in Austria, together with uh, Professor Ganger and the Orthopedic Hospital of Schweizing. And as a pediatrician, we, we always try to see kind of a global approach of a disorder, if possible. So for dealing with phosphate disorders like XLH, I want to start very globally or universally with the universe itself. And as you all know, the universe consists of a lot of elements of which phosphate is actually a very, very rare one. It's the 17th, 17th common element in the universe. So it's really sparse. And saying that, it has such an imminent influence and role in so many metabolic processes. There's nearly not one process in physiology which doesn't involve phosphate in energy metabolism, as structure, as appetite, or even acting as a hormone, as paracrine factor. So phosphate is something sparse, which is of extreme importance because of its chemical features. Therefore, physiology has a very tight regulation of phosphate levels involving a lot of hormones, including PTH, and since 20 years we know of a hormone called FGF23, which is the main regulator of kidney excretion of phosphate. And this is the hormone which we deal with in XLH. This is, as you all know, the pattern mechanism in uh, X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. And I'll come to that in a second. So what's the deal now with this phosphate? And still I'm not speaking specifically on XLH, but on phosphate in general. There's something which I usually call the knock knee phosphate axis. So phosphate is a crucial paracrine factor acting on the growth plate. You all know those knees uh, better probably than me. Um, and we, we do have the, the growth plates here uh, schematically uh, uh, displayed and also in the histological view with those tiny resting chondrocytes squeezing up, going down, uh, ballooning to, to hypertrophic chondrocytes and then doing the ossification to provide the basis for linear growth. And exactly this last and very important process of ossification and of apoptosis of chondrocytes is depending on phosphate. Without phosphate, those cells can't go into apoptosis. And we do get a feature which you're all aware of, rickets. Um, clinically, with this uh, like swollen uh, metaphysical bands, histologically with this 
large chondrocytes not able to, to uh, undergo apoptosis or, and we will hear a lot of that with the typical picture in a uh, radiographic picture um, uh, of rickets. And this is a picture of nutritional rickets, of vitamin D deficiency, which is of course one of the most common uh, types of rickets. And the problem in clinics is vitamin D deficiency is pretty easily to be treated. And you will see a lot of deformities being um, associated with vitamin D deficiency. And as you might appreciate here on the right side of my, of my slide, um, there are two, two radiographs, both show rickets, and one is XLH, and one, one is X-linked hyperphosphatemia. And on the first glance, it's not easy to, to, uh, to make the difference. Um, uh, so basically, rickets look mostly like rickets, be, as, it, as it is vitamin D deficiency, or rare hereditary uh, rickets. And the difference that we see in internal medicine in lab is that if you see severe rickets, you might expect the severe parameters, like you all know, high ALP, high PTH, of course, low 25D, um, when you see severe radiographs. If you have a type like XLH, you usually see much more moderate labs than the radiograph would uh, would uh, su uh, suggest. So if you see this discrepancy between the x-ray and the labs, please always think of uh, hereditary forms of rickets, which entirely differ in their treatment perspective. This is also the urine urinary excretion, which is important, but a bit tricky to calculate. So when we go a little deeper, the mechanism how phosphate is conserved or released in the body is quite complicated and nearly every step in the tubular regulation of phosphate reabsorption can have a defect. So there is not one type of hereditary hyperphosphatemia, there's quite a bunch of them. And the most common one is XLH, being a defect in a, in a special regulatory protein which we're still not sure how it really affects phosphate metabolism, we just know that it results in elevated FGF23 levels, so the body is not able to preserve the phosphate, it runs out of the, of the tubule of the kidney, um, it's like a, a, leaking, um, a leak, leaking can of water where you just have the phosphate running out. So um, what you see here is radiographs. Radiographs, which you're probably very much aware of, which we'll see during the course of the session as well. Um, but um, you see not the severest one, you see typical radiographs of the disorder of X-linked hyperphosphatemia. Um, the prevalence is given with around one in 20,000. Um, so this might sound like rare, it is a rare disorder, but if you count around Europe, we do have like 10 to 25,000 patients with XLH, and the UK is already excluded in that numbers. So we have a lot of patients and we have a lot to overlook or a lot to improve um, if we fish those patients early and start the correct treatment. Why is that important? The patients suffer. They have a high burden of illness. This is uh, some quite recent data on life quality of adults and children with excellent type of phosphatemia. And you might appreciate that um, bone pains, severe bone pains, are very common even uh, among children. And we do have abnormal gait in over 80% of the patients. So um, short stature, 80 to 90% of the patients, bone pains and stiffness in nearly every adult patient, those patients suffer. And uh, in our yearly evaluation of life quality at our center, we do some SQL, qualitative life testing. I'm not the biggest fan of qualitative life testing, it's artificial, but I want to give you a rough comparison of the patients that I'm directly treating. And you see here a cohort with osteogenesis imperfecta, just treated patients, so just patients with at least one vertebral fracture, so not the, the very, um, the very mild ones, those are the severe ones. And you might see that we have physical quality of life around 70% of normal. And you might appreciate my XLH cohort, they're like 20% below the osteogenesis imperfecta because they have so much chronic pain and burden of disease. So this 
group of patients really needs our help to be able to lead a normal life. And one paper in literature, which I very, very much recommend, and probably all of you know that or have heard about it, is the uh, clinical practice recommendations, which have been published in 2019 in Nature Re uh, Reviews, which really give for all aspects of the disorder a very good overview. And what I want to do in, those, in this, this talk here now, give you the impression that treatment is, is so much more than just talking about the pharmacological treatment. Um, so I just wanted to give you in this evaluation chart, which is recommended in the, in the practice guidelines, which discipline is involved just in the basis evaluation of an XLH patient. And you see here that just this basis evaluation already includes seven disciplines at least to do the workup of an XLH patient. So you need to work together and every discipline has to bring in a speciality which the other probably can't compensate. And this, for a very large part, includes orthopedics and pediatric orthopedics. And of course, pediatrics, um, functional therapies, those are probably the key players in the treatment of XLH, including all the others. To give you an impression that XLH is much more than just rickets or lower limb deformities, I just picked out some samples that we have to deal with. This very complex defect in mineralization and this genetic defect in FEX, which is, uh, which is kind of an osteocyte protein, leads to very differentiated um, osteo uh, or bone effects, especially in membranous bone like we have in the, in the mandible or, uh, or in the periodontal tissue. So we have the only uh, diagnosis here which causes sterile abscesses of, the, of, the, of teeth. And if you don't have a dentist who knows that, patients have an extraction of nearly all their teeth when they're 10 or 12 years old. So this is something which is entirely different in the pathogenesis than probably the deformities. Another thing which has to be talked because it's also important for you as surgeons to uh, inform your anesthetist is that those patients do have um, problems with the skull. They do have craniosynostosis, but also a higher rate of Chiari malformations. They can have syringomyelia. They can have uh, problems during surgery because, uh, for that, especially those patients who have craniosynostosis and teeth problems do suffer of Chiari malformation. And this is a problem which has to be excluded by MRI. So I don't want to go into detail, but you have a problem in the skull as well, and you, there, there's um, probably some specialist which has to be consulted um, if the anesthetist is not sure about that. Talking about growth, pediatricians are crazy about linear growth. We, we love that. We love growth charts. We love improving growth in patients. We love giving growth hormone and growth hormone deficiency. So do we in XLH. And the problem with XLH is we're very much focused on pharmacological treatment. So you see here our uh, typical on the right side, the typical growth curve of a patient. And here was kind of the, the diagnosis. And here we started with um, pharmacological treatment, with conventional treatment those days. And if I mark now the target height of the patient, which was the 75 fifth percentile, you might appreciate even with optimal treatment, this patient was really cared for very well we do have a high discrepancy. So this is what we can uh, what, what we can achieve when we improve the rickets very much. What can't we achieve as, as pediatricians is the deformity. So you know better than me that these deformities, just from the matter of angle, cost a lot of centimeters. Those torsions, those complex defects that we have, they are costing centimeters. And we still don't have an optimal approach for that. And we very much depend on your specific expertise to have those patients optimally cared because we can't do anything, everything with pharmacological treatments. Talking about the treatments, the treatments, there are two major types. The one is the conventional treatment um, consisting of high dose oral phosphate and activated vitamin D like calcitriate or alpha calcidol. And you have now the situation that you're giving a patient who is leaking phosphate because of a dysregulation, even more phosphate. Um, 
And uh, so you're in, in physiology, you're, you're really heating up a mechanism with a very high FGF23 excretion without being able to cure or uh, ameliorate the, the, um, the pathologic uh, cause that you have, which is the increased FGF23. So it's, it's, a, it's not a curative treatment, it's an amelioration of rickets by giving three, four, five times a day a high dose of phosphate to provide in, in those minutes or hours after the, after the dose um, enough phosphate to, uh, to allow mineralization. And this high dose phosphate therapy has quite some side effects, including hypercalcuria, hyperparathyroidism, um, and hypercalcemia if, you, if you're not working uh, with like a very uh, tightly uh, dosed treatment. So this is a treatment which needs quite some expertise, is not easy, and not every patient is compliant to that. In infants, we use nightly dosings. In puberty, you can imagine that um, a teenager is not really, um, really uh, happy with having five to six dosages of phosphate every day. So the second treatment option, which in, uh, evolved now in the last years and which we have now the, the global license for, is acting in the PETO mechanism, in the increased FGF23, which leads to the excretion in the kidney. And this treatment that we have is a monoclonal antibody, which binds FGF23 and improves the, the reabsorption of phosphate in the kidney. So this is now a, a, not an amelioration of phosphate levels, but an amelioration of the PETO mechanism in the kidney. We, for the first time, many patients do have normal phosphate serum levels. In terms of improvements, this is now the Lansen study, which leads to the, lead, uh, led to the global licensing. Um, you might appreciate in the x-ray in the middle that after treatment, um, you see an improvement of the rickets. So this radiographic improvement is probably the most improvement or the, the best understood improvement that you see with this um, therapy. What we can't change that much, even if it's significant, and I want to, to show you now the graph on the, on the upper left side, is the linear growth. And as I already mentioned, um, growth is so much more than just having the rickets healed out in XLH. So we have, in change from baseline, we have 0.2 roughly, a standard deviation which we improve. The complex deformities, which are not rickets derived, is something which we probably can, cannot address properly with this treatment. Even if rickets get so much better and many patients profit a lot, linear growth is not that much improved and deformities, which are not directly rickets derived, neither. So this is again the x-ray. And so um, I don't and I can't go into detail because that's definitely your field, but there are so many techniques and there's so much expertise um, for orthopeds to kind of to, to improve the angle and the mechanic situation for patients. And this means for me that uh, we have, as pediatrician, we, we have to work together with you um, and we have to find partners in all disciplines for this very multidisciplinary disorder, uh, especially from the terms of orthopedics, pediatrics, and adult medicine, because those patients don't have a decreased life expectancy. We need to have a good transition after growth. We need to have them cared for the problems after, after re reaching adulthood to give them back as much as possible of their life quality and of their mobility. And that means that we have to work together. And this is probably more important than choice of pharmacological treatments and sometimes maybe even more important than the choice of this or that um, surgical approach is that people have to sit together and find the best way for the patients. Um, to show how complex the care is, this is our internal treatment plan for um, XLH patients. So you have so many involved disciplines and it's a, a very rough schedule. The patients are very, very, uh, uh, let's say, entertained in a positive way, they have to do quite a lot. And we have to see quite a lot to avoid complications and to find the best way to guide them through uh, the age and the bone development until skeletal maturity is reached. And 
this is one of my favorite slides because you are, as we are, sending our patients to functional therapy. And this is my slide for functional therapy in XLH. We all depend on that. We all need, depend on physiotherapy, on, air, uh, on mental therapy in patients with such um, deformities. But we don't have that much evidence what, what is good for the patient. What do we have to do specifically? There's so little out in literature. And I'm sure we'll hear some more data. I just wanted to show this um, very nice data from, from Gabriel Mindler, where I was involved as well. Um, and what, what we saw in, in, uh, in doing gait analysis in patients with XLH is that there is a lot of lateral trunk lean um, uh, in the stance and swing phase. And we see lateral trunk lean, especially when we do have a varus knee. Uh, so there, those are like the first data where we can understand the complex gait pathophysiology in XLH. And um, we also saw that the gait uh, quality or the, the, um, the gait problem is very much depending on BMI. So even, even if, we, if we have a good surgical result, this might just, just having a, a child which is um, obese might worse your surgical outcome a lot. So that actually means that we all have to work together, especially those three disciplines which I mentioned here, and we have to find data um, to make the optimal treatment for those patients. So to come to an end, um, I, I want to, to uh, thank you for, um, for uh, listening to your pediatrician and writing uh, me here and to give you the stimulus and the motivation in the care for XLH patient to hug a colleague. That's what we say usually in transition. So um, to get in touch with, uh, with other disciplines, with other specialities, and to try to make a treatment um, scheme, a management scheme, which involves those people from other disciplines, which have the time and the resources to deal with their part. And the last thing is we have to collect data. So in rare disorders, we need to learn more about the specific um, aspects of the disease to care better for those patients. So I very much invite you to get in touch um, and um, I would be happy to have collaborations, to collect data and to get our heads together to care for this very vulnerable patient cohort. Um, thank you very much. So um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to uh, Professor Horn to his talk where I'm already very excited to, to listen to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my presentation. I, first, I would like to thank uh, Rudolf Ganger for the invitation to actively participate in this exciting webinar. And the topic of my presentation is uh, clinical radiographic and functional aspects of uh, XLH. So, as we already heard in the, in the excellent first presentation today, XLH is a multi-systemic disorder, so we need a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach. And the team at our hospital and also consists of the pediatric endocrinologist, geneticist, radiologist, a representative from the National Resource Center, physiotherapist, and then pediatric orthopedic uh, surgeon. And ERM Bond, the European Reference Network for Rare Bone um, Diseases, is recently established. And they chose three major diseases to be prioritized as exemplar conditions, and XLH is one of these conditions. And um, the reason for this is the frequency of the disease and the gravity of this devastating disorder, which requires urgent improvement of early diagnosis and management for good long-term outcome. And another reason is the difficulty and complexity of the diagnosis and treatment, and of course, the um, emergence of new drugs, as uh, Adabert also uh, presented in the first uh, talk today. So I think XLH is a very relevant condition as a topic for an EPOS uh, webinar, as we have today. Adabert also mentioned this publication. I would also like to emphasize um, the importance of the multidisciplinary approach. This publication uh, emerged from members of another European reference group. It's the Ra Kidney Disease Reference Network. And um, 
the publication provides uh, practice guidelines and um, as you can see the core group uh, comprised specialists from different fields and also um, patient representatives and as you also can see um, Deborah Eastwood the former president of EPOS and a very active member of EPOS is uh, a co-author uh, of this presentation along with uh, Philip uh, Wickard who also is a pediatric orthopedic uh, surgeon. So I start to show the radiographic features in XLH. Um, in order to understand the radiological features, um, we look a little bit at the pathophysiology of the disease. So um, as we already heard from Adelbert, uh, the ossocytes secrete increased amounts of fibroblast growth factor uh, 23. So the local effect is um, a periosteocytic uh, lesion, as you can see right here, and systemic effect is the renal phosphate absorption is suppressed and the low serum uh, phosphorus level. So this leads to a mineralization defect at the growth plate. And this again results in widening of the growth plate and the so-called uh, cupping, which is a, a kind of a convex appearance uh, of, the, of the growth plate toward the, towards the metaphysis. So the growth plate cartilage is usually a straight, thin stripe of uniform thickness. And in the middle of this slide, you can see a normal growth plate. In XLH, the growth plate chondrocytes lose their columnar arrangement, and we see accumulation of hypertrophic cartilage. So the boundary between growth cartilage and metaphyseal bone is irregular. So the zone of provisional, uh, um, provisional calcification is less distinct than in a normal growth plate. And we see, as you can see here in the hypophosphatemic mouse, uh, a protruding, protruding areas of cartilage extending through the primary spongiosa. So in the growing skeleton, the XLH is causing the appearance of rickets. So it's an affection of the growth plate and we see the deficiency is most evident at the metaphyseal zones. We see a fraying, which is a laceration of the, of the metaphysis, as you can see here on the right side in the distal femur. Uh, and we see, can see a cupping, which is a wave-like appearance of the metaphysis. Um, and we can see flaring, which means a widening of the growth plate. And we see that the, the zone of uh, provisional uh, calcification is irregular. And we can see coarse, which means rough trabecula. At the same time, the cortical bone is preserved. So here, is a, here are some wrist pictures from Robinson and colleagues. On the left side, you see the wrist and you see typical fraying and cupping. Um, the female, um, the girl is eight months old, and after 26 months of treatment, you see a normalization and no more uh, radiological findings um, uh, uh, like in rickets. So, which means that the radiological findings in rickets are not only for diagnosis, but also for monitoring of uh, treatment. Furthermore, in the growing skeleton, we see bowing of long bones. So, we might see uh, chinovarum, we might see chinovalgum. In almost all cases, we see uh, procovatum deformities in the femur and the tibia. And the abnormal abnormalities are at sites of rapid growth, which means in the distal femur, in the proximal and distal tibia, in the distal radius, and typically they affect the costochondral junctions and they result in um, appearance of rosary, which is an enlargement of the osteochondral junctions and we see a Harrison groove, which is a groove along the lower um, uh, thorax um, border. And this groove comes through uh, due to pulling forces from the diaphragm on the softened bone. So the radiographic appearance um, in XLH is quite variable. It depends on the amount of accumulated hypertrophic cartilage. And the axial widening of the growth plate is supposed to be the first sign. However, it might be difficult to recognize because the true width of the fascia cartilage cannot be determined until ossification centers are well developed. So more useful early signs might be um, the decreased mineralization of the terminally differentiated cartilage at the zone of provisional um, calcification, which normally is an and clear opaque line, but it becomes progressively less distinct, as you can see here uh, in the uh, femoral neck. And the metaphyseal trabecular bone fades into loosened uh, cartilage of the physis, 
with no distinct uh, margin. In more severe rickets, um, the enlarging mass of disorganized facial cartilage expands in multiple directions, not only axial, causing the cupping appearance, but also transverse. And this causes the typical enlargement of bone ends. And it might also expand uh, into the metaphyseal region, uh, causing a collapse of poorly mineralized tubercular bone and uh, leading to uh, cupping, as I mentioned. So involvement of the physis is usually uniform, but it might also be limited to the medial aspect of the distal femoral and proximal tibial physis, and then leading to genovarum. Less often, we see a disproportionate involvement of the lateral physis, which then leads to genovarum. Compressive stress is worsening the already impaired bone growth in the lower extremities. In adolescence, the recognition of rickets at, at wrist and knees becomes increasingly difficult because the physis is narrowing and it begins to close. So for evaluation of the physis for, uh, for secondary ossification centers of the iliac crest and ischial tuberosities becomes more helpful in this group of patients because they may be abnormally white as presented by Hunter and colleagues um, um, in this picture in a 14-year-old girl and she has normal hand radiographs, as you can see here. In adults with uh, XLH, um, we see a variety of age-related abnormalities. We see, like in this picture here, a trapezoidal uh, appearance of the distal femur, or we can see metacarpal um, phalangeal ossicles, or we can see here a flattening of the talus um, and the shortening of the tala neck, which is uh, typical for adult patients with XLH. Or we can see looser zones, mostly in older subjects, which is kind of a pseudo fracture. We see a uh, curvature of long bones in all age groups. We see osteoarthritis in the ankle, knee, in the foot, in the sacroiliac joint, and the wrist. And we see extra osseous calcification, including Antesio fights and antesiopathy and spinal stenosis. And we see ossification of the iliolumbar and iliosacral ligaments, as you can see on this picture on the right side. So here again, the appearance of the trapezoidal femur, the ossicles, and the talus, which is quite typical. And um, when we talk about the clinical and functional aspects in XLH, there is an overlap between the pediatric and adult population. I would recommend this uh, publication from Beck Nielsen. So the, 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 the figure you see is adapted from this publication. I would recommend everyone to read this publication, which gives a really good overview over all complaints in pediatric and adult population. And it also provides the pathophysiological uh, moments behind the complaints. So I will run quickly through the most important clinical findings according to different age groups. So in early infancy, most patients become symptomatic at age one to two. We see a delayed walking, we see abnormal gait, we see angular deformities and often torsional deformities and most often in internal torsion. So the upper extremities are involved to a lesser degree because we have no weight bearing in the upper extremity. We see a slow growth rate usually below two standard deviations of the mean. And we see late dentition or multiple dental abscesses, which are highly prevalent in patients uh, older than three years. And um, we also see that one out of three uh, patients with XLH are overweight or obese in comparison to normal population. At a mean age of 15.9 years, almost 40% of the individuals with XLH are obese or overweight. So BMI uh, should be carefully monitored, as Adabert also uh, mentioned in the first talk today. So in early infancy, we see, um, of course, bowing and the location and degree of bowing is age dependent. It's most pronounced in the low extremity, of course, with weight bearing, most frequently varus, as I said, but also valgus and windswept deformity. Actually, publication which um, um, is from the uh, uh, hospital in, in Spicing uh, showed uh, seven cases of uh, windswept deformity. So, and prior to uh, weight bearing at age um, uh, zero to two years, we see 
almost always an anterior bow in the tibia uh, due to forces uh, through the Achilles tendon. And you can have, even in siblings, you can have both valgus and varus deformity. Um, you see this female which, who is five years and the male 15 years, they are siblings. So the girl, she has a valgus deformity and her brother has a severe varus deformity. But in all, almost all cases, we see procovatum in the femur and the tibia. And please keep in mind the normal development of the knee axis, uh, as uh, demonstrated in publications by Selenius and Wanka and Westhoff. Um, so because you see the picture in the middle, this is still a physiological genovarum in a two-year-old uh, boy. On the right uh, side, you see a physiological genovarum. Um, in, a, in a girl older than three years. So another publication uh, which emerged from um, the hospital in Spicing is the one who, uh, by Mintler, who Adabert also mentioned in the first talk today. So in this uh, gait analysis um, study, they found um, increased uh, internal knee rotation, external hip rotation, and a decreased sagittal ankle and knee range of motion. And as Adabert already mentioned, an increased lateral trunk lean or waddling gait. And this was correlated both with knee virus and an increased BMI. And they found an overall reduced gait deviation index, which means an um, reduced gait quality in the patients. Here you see a, a patient with a severe virus deformity and you see the, the waddling gait. So the waddling gait is uh, definitely associated uh, with uh, uh, low limb uh, virus deformity. What about growth? Adabert mentioned growth um, already in his first talk. Um, Rod <clears throat> Rodriguez concluded that the underlying pathogenic mechanism of growth impairment is not known, and pediatric patients treated conventionally do not achieve normal adult stature. And impaired limb growth with relatively preserved trunk growth results in a disproportionate, disproportionate uh, short stature, and there's no conclusive evidence. The, antibody against uh, FGF23 might increase uh, growth velo velocity. Adults, they show also short stature and um, osteomalacia and variable bone pain. And they often show a generalized muscle weakness and osteoarthritis and pseudo fractures, stiffness in joints, entesopathies, poor dental conditions. And we have to make sure that we um, uh, distinguish the osteomalacia related bone pain from osteoarthritis uh, related pain. Another, I think, important uh, publication is the one by Seyfried and colleagues who looked, who did a systematic review and included quite a lot of uh, papers. And they could show that XLH impacts uh, quality of life quite a lot. It limitates uh, daily activities and it has a significant economic impact on the healthcare system, the society, and the patients. And they concluded that adults with XLH may not receive appropriate care and treatment, and that XLH in adults is associated with a really considerable disease burden. Another publication I would encourage you to, to read if you uh, treat and follow patients with uh, XLH is the one by uh, Rotenbuller and colleagues. Um, this publication is a review paper and it really provides a detailed um, workup uh, scheme for the time of diagnosis uh, and where you should measure the um, severity of rickets and you should assess possible complications and you should measure renal function and uh, morphology. And furthermore, the publication uh, provides a protocol for follow-up of possible complications uh, which are associated with XLH, such as craniosynostosis and premature fusion of cranial sutures, the hearing loss, dental problems, growth, and nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis, uh, and uh, maybe also cardiovascular screening. So with this uh, last slide and a few impressions from Oslo from the last days, uh, and a reminder to um, to participate in the upcoming EPOS meeting in April. I would like to thank you, and I close my presentation.
And now I give the word to Christopher Adler, um, who gives the last talk on the orthopedic treatment options. So thank you very much. So those are my disclosures. So we have very impressively heard about the clinical manifestations. We've seen the various, the valgus deformities, uh, windswept deformities were mentioned, and of course, torsional deformities. And all of this impairs the gait pattern. And then we have the short stature disproportion. So uh, it was clearly visible that this is a major burden and it's a functional problem. But still, when do we need surgery and do we need surgery? So what does the more purely orthopedic literature say? Uh, so it, it was shown by Novais and co-workers in 2006 that uh, there are progressive deformities despite medical interventions. And it's rather rare that there's a spontaneous improvement of the deformity. And we know from the classic Sharma and co-workers that severe deformities are very likely to end up in osteotritis. This is something that has also been shown very nicely uh, in the last, last talk. So regarding the indication for surgery, it depends a little bit on deformity versus like, like, uh, like osteotomies versus the guided growth. There is a nice paper uh, in Journal of Children's Orthopedics from 2017 uh, looking at guided growth. And they recommend surgery for mechanical axis progression through zone two or into zone three despite one year of optimized medical treatment. From uh, the more adult uh, perspective, there is a, a paper from the Swiss group here um, that shows that a correction of crack resistant deformity is indicated and they recommend it for preventation of, of secondary complications like pain, degenerative arthropathy, or for cosmetic reasons. So guided growth has been around for some years now, especially with these plates and screw systems, and it has become quite popular. And it has been shown by Stephens and co-workers as early as 2008 to be a good option in these pathologies. They recommend a uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite early intervention. Uh, the same paper as I, I mentioned before showed that it is a successful and minimal invasive methods to address this uh, coronal plane deformities. Now that's what we did uh, and that's what we agree on uh, in, in Schweising. So if we see a deformity like this, there's a five-year-old female uh, patient with a quite severe varus deformity. You can see uh, mechanical axis is way, uh, way out of the knee joint and uh, we did a guided growth. You can see six months after surgery, 16 months after surgery, and finally nearly two years after surgery. So this shows us it takes quite a long time, uh, and uh, but it does work very nicely. Of course, what works for Vieros, it also works for Valgus. You can see this uh, Valgus deformity, again, a uh, seven-year-old female patient, more severe on the right than the left side. And you can see with guided growth, uh, uh, continuous improvement. Of course, you need to be prepared if there is an asymmetry of the severity of deformity, you might need to remove like one side before you remove the other side, and that's what we've been doing in this case. And this x-ray is the last picture before we removed the remaining uh, two plate screws uh, after 13 months. Now, if guided growth is no longer an option, we need to think about osteotomies. And for fixation of osteotomies, of course, we do have quite uh, many uh, different options. We can use K-wires, plates, intramedullary nails, or external fixation. And there have been some papers on all of these uh, different uh, so possibilities. So let's uh, have a look at the pros and cons of these this types of fixation. So K-wires, uh, they can only be used in young patients, usually together with casting. Uh, so this is a patient group where in many cases we, we maybe now do guided growth, but of course if there is severe rotational problem, uh, we still, we still uh, might, uh, might do this. Now plates, they have a limited indication in complex deformities. There are a possibility for uh, juxtarticular deformities and of course for rotational deformities, especially in the tibia, they are quite common. 
uh, solution. Intermetal so uh, the intermetallary nails uh, are a great option uh, for adult patients. In many cases, you need uh, multiple osteotomies, and of course, uh, sometimes if it's a very complex deformity, this might limit the possibility to use it. So external fixation is, of course, the workhorse for complex and uh, multiplanar deformities. It allows the gradual correction, and you can, of course, uh, correct rotation, procovarum, and uh, frontal plane malalignment at the same time. Uh, I want to show you some um, typical cases. So this is a female patient uh, that was diagnosed at the age of 11 years, presented at the age of 18 years, and uh, had surgery at that age, you can see there's a quite severe varus deformity. Knees are pointing outwards to compensate for uh, the decreased tibial torsion. You can see we had to take two x-rays because it wouldn't fit on one cassette. Uh, we did a CT scan to uh, measure the tibial torsion. You can see the femoral antiversion was fine. Uh, tibial torsion was reduced to zero on the right side, two on the left side, the various deformity quite severe. Uh, we did a digital planning and also uh, um, we wanted to see what it would look like in the end if we do the three osteotomies here. And then we took this to the OR and, and corrected the patient with six axis frames. So one frame on the femur, two frames on the tibia, stacked on top of each other and here you can see what we do in the OR to find the exact spot and a point of rotation to correct the deformity at the right uh, core or apex of the deformity. These are the x-rays right, uh, right after surgery. You can see it's quite a lot of metal, but of course it also is very powerful in the correction. Uh, on the femur, we did two programs. We, did, um, uh, we corrected 23 degrees of varus. We corrected 10 degrees of procovarum and uh, we did two centimeters of lengthening. In the proximal tibia, 24 degrees of varus with some lengthening, and in the distal tibia, again, a varus correction, but also correction of rotation, 20 degrees of rotation, and you can see uh, that we needed to go back and correct a little bit of um, the distal tibial joint line again, because when you change the rotation, you also change the angulation a little bit. So this can be very nicely fine-tuned at the end with the frame. This is now the patient at day nine of the correction program, at day 16 of the correction program, 23, 31, 42, at the end of all programs. And you can see we always do a long-standing x-ray in the end. You can really very nicely uh, manage the mechanical axis this way. So four months after the last program, uh, the bone was healed very nicely. The mineralization sometimes takes a little bit longer. So uh, this is the clinical picture. And you can see by, by, by this two, two and one centimeter lengthening, and of course by straightening it out, uh, she got a, quite a big uh, license discrepancy at, at this stage. And this is before and after frame removal. We protected the new regenerate with an intramedullary rush pin on the femur. Of course, we did the same procedure on the left side. And again, you can see the correction of the procovarum, the varus, and the torsion. And in the end, we ended up with a very nice uh, two straight legs, same leg length, and a very nice clinical and functional result. Now, this is a patient, adult patient, a uh, 24-year-old female patient that's had a lot of surgeries previous uh, somewhere else. And you can see uh, there is quite a severe deformity on the left side. So this is partly iatrogenic, partly uh, the original problem. So we can appreciate that there is a, quite a various deformity. Uh, there is some translation, uh, there is some procovarum and the procovarum is actually quite big. You can see in the lateral view, we needed to correct like 36 degrees of procovarum. You can imagine that this could be very difficult uh, to do acutely or with a nail. You would need to shorten and cut out big pieces of bone to, to get this straightened out. So in this case, 
uh, I decided for a, again a frame on the left side with a bilevel frame on the femur and a gradual correction thereby lengthening of the femoral and the tibial deformity and again you can see in the end we we can still fine-tune to get a good mechanical axis uh, when the left side was was corrected again with this stabilized with the um, with the rush pins we looked at the right side and on the right side uh, the tibia was normal you can see the mpta is 87 so no deformity on the tibia but of course there was deformity and there was like two centimeter shortening of the femur but because of the 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 deformity of because of the cora, the apex of the deformity, this was a case for a retrograde lengthening nail. Uh, you can see uh, I did an acute correction with a fixed assisted nailing with a precise intermediary lengthening nail. And so we first corrected, we then ream, we then uh, make sure that we, we keep the axis by using these blocking screws, the two screws that are next to the nail to make sure that we keep the alignment during lengthening and as you can see at the end of lengthening we have a nice alignment we corrected 15 degrees of varus and this two centimeter lengthening and this is a follow-up uh, one year after surgery uh, the nail was removed nine one year nine months after surgery so what are the, the considerations in, in doing osteotomies, in doing uh, bony corrections? Recurrence. Recurrence has been uh, recognized as a problem for quite a long time. Song and co-workers in 2006 published on the recurrence after external fixation and or intramedullary nailing. And they found that they had a 48% recurrence rate in the group of external fixation only and 5% when they used an intermedullary nail after external fixation. Uh, we also published a study of patients uh, in 2008 where we looked at various fixation techniques, wires, plates, nails, and fixators. We had the same experience in regards of a lot of recurrence. Um, we had a recurrence rate of 90% after the first intervention, 60% uh, after the second intervention, which was at an older age. What we didn't find was that nails were so superior in keeping the axis. We found that they just made uh, the recurrence in the metaphysis or in the juxtaarticular area. I have to admit that those cases have been quite a long time ago, so I'm quite sure that many of our patients were not really very well balanced metabolically and from their medication. So, Recurrence in uh, relation to fixation. Uh, so, Iris and co workers found in a very small group of patients that if you span the whole bone, the, the whole length of the bone, with uh, an internal fixation, then you have less recurrence. Um, this was also found and recommended by uh, this study group from Turkey in 2011. Uh, Popkov and co workers, they combined external fixation with flexible chromatillary nails. And they had a little bit the same experience that uh, we had. So they, they found no recurrent deformities, like in the part of the bone that was reinforced by the intramedullary nails, but above and below at the metaphysis. So this, it seems that uh, the intramedullary fixation can limit the recurrence, but not uh, completely stop it or exclude it. Now, what seems to be, of course, uh, a very big uh, parameter is age. Uh, so this, I think, is a very important study by Isar and co-workers. They looked at patients uh, and at their recurrence rate in relation to their age. And they found in a group below 11 years of age, a recurrence of 46% between 11 and 5. And if the patients were like, after 15 years at the time of surgery, the other recurrence rates dropped to 19%. Of course, the metabolic parameters play an important uh, factor. And so also in 2002, Choi and co-workers found that, uh, of course, the peeling index of uh, patients that had a correction and lengthening with Ilisarov 
method uh, had a significant uh, correlation to the serum phosphate levels. This was not shown for guided growth. So it seems that guided growth works and does not show this, this, this uh, a correlation to the metabolic parameters, but this was found for the velocity and the response to surgery. Um, it would be necessary to see if this if this is this is maybe not true for the recurrence rate if you look at the longer term. Now, in conclusion, of course, the medication is the basis, and the optimum medication is key to, to our orthopedic success. So, this is extremely important. Uh, there is a strong uh, there is strong a uh, reason for to use the early guided growth for persistent for persistent deformities, and with a uh, guided growth, we also have the possibility to repeat it. So if there is recurrence during growth, we can uh, repeat the guided growth and uh, still protect the mechanical axis. Uh, nevertheless, we need to be aware that we can't correct rotational deformities. That maybe at the end of growth, there needs to be some touch-up surgery to correct rotation or to correct some residual deformities. For this, osteotomies, of course, are a good choice and uh, it really depends on the deformity, it depends on uh, the plane of the deformity, on the complexity, on the apex, the core of the deformity, if it can be corrected with a nail plate or the frame. I think it's important to have all this so all these options within your treatment uh, indications. Thank you very much. So um, uh, I'd like to thank now uh, all uh, the speakers for the excellent presentations and we can start with our uh, question session. So first I have two questions to Dr. Ryman. First question is, uh, you mentioned the new strategy of treatment using Pusuma. So what are the indications in your institution to use Pusuma? Is it possible for all the patients? So that's a, that's a very good question, actually. So um, this is very differently handled from every country and every health system because of the high costs of, the, of this treatment. Um, in UK and in Germany, every patient gets on Borosumab because it's paid for by the health insurances. In Austria, we do have established a special regimen, a special um, a plan, which, which um, symptoms or which, uh, which uh, factors we do have for a, a therapy failure on the conventional treatment. So no, except in special situations, we start on conventional treatment. We see if the treatment works, and there is a subset of patients where it works pretty fine. And um, for those patients who have failure for growth reasons, for metabolic reasons, or for other reasons, um, we, we uh, apply for borosumab for the health insurance. So I have approximately one third of my patients on the borosumab. Okay, thank you. And I have a second question to you. Um, you mentioned um, you showed uh, a growth chart with a decreased growth rate in children uh, with uh, XAs despite treatment. Uh, did you see the same effect in children treated with Pursuma? That was the question. Uh, thank you. Very important question. Yes. So um, as I, I just quickly have shown in the Lancet study, which uh, was the phase three study for Borosumab, Borosumab has been significantly better in improving the, the growth of those patients, but the level that we see this significant improvement is very low. So we, we talk about 0 0.2 standard deviations in growth. That's, that's quite little over a period of 50 months. That's like not, not even a centimeter. Um, so we, we are talking about a slight amelioration, but definitely not a normalization of linear growth. And as Professor Horn uh, nicely mentioned, we, we don't know exactly what's the pattern mechanism behind this growth impairment in XLH, but it's not just the rickets, which can be cured very well with Verosna. Thank you, Abby. So there's still the possibility to send questions uh, using your question uh, box. 
because uh, we have still uh, some time uh, to continue with our discussion. Uh, I have a question uh, to, um, now to Christoph. Christoph, um, when you use uh, um, guided crews, uh, do you think about the sleeping plate when you finished your correction or you move the plates uh, and maybe think about the new insertion later on? What's your, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, the sleeping plate has been reported on, but I don't, I don't think it's something I would, I would consider because uh, we don't, we don't expect such a quick recurrence, uh, and and we know that if it just stays in there at the end, it might be too small, and you still need to change it, or the, the screw might get too close to the vices. So I don't think that this is something I would uh, recommend for this patient group especially because we have four plates, you don't want to keep four sleeping plates. And it, it's something I, I think I would recommend against. Okay, thank you. And there's an, another question to you. Um, uh, what's, um, how, how you deal uh, pre-op in, in before to do a complex surgery, but what's uh, your opinion about uh, the metabolic parameters? Uh, what, um, what do you think about that? Is it important or how do you deal with that? I think it's very important and uh, I think that's, that just highlights the need to have good partners uh, from the pediatric side that can make sure so that you can make sure together that the patient is very well prepared before surgery, that the parameters are okay and that you can go on and, and achieve a nice correction. Thank you very much. I think it's very, very important to think about multidisciplinary approach in, in that disease. Absolutely. Maybe a, a question to Joachim. Um, sometimes there is a debate about um, the um, uh, use of, of, of guided crews in XLH patients, especially when we, when we think about uh, uh, meetings uh, where um, a lot of pediatricians are there. So it was my experience. What do you think about that? Yeah, as uh, Christoph already mentioned in his uh, excellent talk, I think in XLH you need all the tools in your toolbox uh, which you need for deformity correction, including guided growth, acute correction with plates, <clears throat> and the TSF and um, the intermedullary nail. So yes, in the younger patients uh, we use the guided growth, or even in the older old, uh, as well. It depends on the degree of deformity, um, but I think it's it's worth trying guided growth. Um, of course, you can't address the uh, uh, torsional deformity, so a few patients might need a de-rotation in the distal tibia later on, and you can't address the brocovatum deformity. But my experience is all, both patients have a brocovatum deformity, they have normal um, range of motion in the knee, they don't have a lack of extension in the knee, which we maybe could expect when you have a brocovatum deformity in the femur. So I think in, there is a place for guided growth in XLH. But it depends on the deformity and the age of the patient. Thank you. I do think uh, that at the moment there is enough uh, evidence in literature to use uh, guided growth because that was something uh, under debate or should we do more um, research on that topic? Of course we should do more research. Um, it's a rare disease. Uh, it's, it's rare deformities, and as Adabert mentioned, there uh, is a need for for more uh, collaboration between centers to gather patients um, and to to look at the results. So I think, of course, there is a lack of evidence. Of course. Okay, thank you. Maybe another question to Christoph: uh, What's um, the the role of the facie du nail in in kids with XLH? Uh, do you have any experience with that? Uh, I, I would add this more carefully because I think uh, it's it's not. I think during growth we can very nicely like address the recurrence uh, with a good medication and maybe a repeated guided growth. So we don't have any. I mean, there's there's no increased risk of fracture. So I don't think it's it's necessary to. Uh, stabilize the bone during this period of growth and I think that I mean the facet of round nail is a very nice tool and if it's necessary like an osteogenesis imperfecta it's great 
but we also know that there is possible complications like uh, the, the locking part uh, being dragged through the physis, which is a possible complication. So if it's not really necessary, I would not recommend it. And this for me would not be an indication in, in those patients in, we're talking about. Thank you. Coming back to Joachim, um, the guide course, what's the recommended uh, age to start in therapy? And you mentioned uh, just before angular and rotational deformities. What's your uh, recommended treatment, type of treatment for those deformities? For the angular and rotational uh, deformities? Mm -hmm. in, in what age? Yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> So the, yeah, the yeah. indications for angular deformities is just as uh, Christoph showed um, to regain uh, a normal mechanical axis. Um, and again, the guided growth, there's a place for guided growth in the younger patients, but um, if, if there's not a place for guided growth, we use frame for acute corrections and uh, we do a derotation. If there is a gate, uh, uh, which is uh, with, the, if there is an intoing gate, uh, often there's intoing gate and Predominantly, there's some um, uh, increased uh, medial torsion in the tibia. I think most patients they need a derotation in the tibia at least later on. And recommended start of treatment with the guided growth? I think as early as possible, as early as you have defined uh, uh, epiphysis and metaphysis to to make sure you can place the the plate properly. I think age three or four is okay to start with. Maybe okay, Christoph you. will start even earlier, but I think um, the epiphysis is not well defined in the age below three years. So I'm a little bit afraid for complications if you if you start very early, but I think up older than three years, I think it's okay. Okay. Uh, back to Christoph. Christoph, Christoph what do you think about, about the, sorry. The, youngest, um, the youngest age you use the A plate in, in XLH? I think in XLH, we, I don't remember a case much younger than four or five years, but I, I did use eight plates in a patient about two and a half years. I mean, it is possible quite safely, especially if you do an arthrogram, then you can really very nicely see where you place your plates. And then I think you can do it very safely and precisely. But I think we also need, I mean, we also wait for a certain like amount of deformity. So we know that we can we can get a good correction uh, from a mechanical axis, which is up to three, four centimeters medial, or really like medial to the knee joint. So of course we want to start very early, uh, but I think we we have some time to wait because um, it does work well. So even if we have um, a virus which is significant, like enough to warrant correction. Okay. Maybe uh, one more question to Adi. Adi, pre up, uh, which um, um, parameters uh, you recommend to check really carefully uh, before start operative treatment? Very good point. So, um, to, to, if I choose one value, I choose ALP. And um, I, I want to really emphasize that ALP is highly age and pubertal stage specific. So, you, you have to look at uh, ALP scores for the age group that you're dealing with, and ALP should be within the normal range. Um, and especially in patients that we that we sometimes see in a pubertal range where where puberty was probably a little a uh, little more ahead, um, we we see that that uh, we you have to to take this puberty aspect in uh, in, uh, in credits as well. Um, so the best thing would be that every patient, especially if you're an osteotomy, has a pre-op PET endo visit, um, which we very nicely have established. We're very thankful for that, Rudy, to, to uh, have done that. And it's, I think that's really a benefit for the patient to be optimized uh, pre-osteotomy especially, um, to have the optimal surgical results and to get most out of the procedures and this uh, range of procedures that you're performing. Um, a second thing, and then I stop, uh, is um, we have to be careful that we apply 25D to the patients. So not in the conventionally treated patients, as well as in the patients with berosumab, we see sometimes that the regular 
uh, cholic calciferol treatment, the regular 25G drops are skipped. And that's not what we want. We see that there is kind of a, a remnant activation um, uh, in XLH, and we want this, this 25D pool to be full, to be prepared to uh, mineralize after your surgeries. Thank you, Adi. Maybe a last question, both to Joachim and Christoph. What do you think about uh, guided growth and overcorrection? Is that uh, useful or is it dangerous? Joachim, please start. Guided growth and? And overcorrection of, of, uh, over of the deformity. I, I think it's, it's dangerous. I okay. think you, you shouldn't do it. Um, also, you should believe that in any deformity where you have an underlying pathology in the bone which leads to the primary deformity, this underlying pathology will still be there when you remove the plate. But still we see sometimes we overcorrect the patients and then they they do not uh, show any recurrence of deformity. So usually we, we wouldn't overcorrect, but rather um, doing a new eight day procedure later on, if necessary. I mean, if you, let's say in, a, in an XLH patient with a virus deformity overcorrect and slightly valgus, I think this is acceptable. But if you have a, a multiple osteochondroma patient with a valgus and you overcorrect them in a virus, then it's really not, not good. So usually in the, in the Congenital um, conditions, we, we, we wouldn't overcorrect actually. And we but would not even uh, have a sleeping eight plate because um, there was an EPOS uh, abstract which showed that there might be a tethering when you still have the plate and you might mm -hmm. have a continuous effect of the plate. Also, we have to remove the metaphyseal screw. Okay, thank you, Joachim and Christoph. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the problem is if we do overcorrect, we again create a, a pathologic loading of the joint. And, and with this pathologic loading, there is a risk of a deformity that then goes into the other direction. Uh, so I think especially in XLH, it's extremely important that, that we try to really stay very close to the middle, the center of the knee joint as, as much as possible. So thank you, Christoph. I think we are now at the end of our webinar. We are really a little bit about time. And I'd like to thank all the speakers for a special effort. Thank you very much to all of you. I'd like to thank all the attendees to take part of this webinar. And my special thanks is going to Sunny, Sunny Hiltonen from the APUS uh, Central Office for her special support. Okay, have a nice evening and bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.